Good morning, West County Bible Church. I hope that today finds you healthy and safe, and the message I'm going to share with you will prove to be a source of encouragement, strength, and lift up your spirits, especially during these troubling times. First, let's get through a few announcements, and the first couple I wanted to do are just personal announcements, and after seven failed attempts and four different stores over three weeks, yesterday I finally struck gold. I found 12 rolls of toilet paper. Woohoo! In my lifetime, I never knew that toilet paper was going to be such a valuable commodity. The other announcements I want to do is um, before the church announcements is I want to give a special shout out to Boardwalk Pizza on Manchester Road. I've come to know a little bit uh, Virgil, who's the owner, and Larissa, who's his employee. And I was in there Friday uh, picking up some carry out. I told him what I was going to be doing, and he was said he was going to uh, check in on Sunday morning. So, uh, Virgil, if you're there, we want to welcome you this morning as well. Announcements, Sunday services are canceled through April. We will continue to stream the messages via our church Facebook site every Sunday at 10 a.m. Ask your friends and family to join us each week. And then next Sunday, April 12th, which is Easter, Josh is going to be giving a special Easter message, which you're going to want to make sure and check out and invite your family and friends. On the 19th, two weeks from this Sunday, we're going to participate for the first time ever in communion together via Facebook. So in preparation, make sure you have elements at home to do this. You don't have to go out and buy grape juice and matzo crackers if you don't have them. Just use what you, uh, what you want and uh, be ready for that special time together. We also need volunteers for our new personal care service ministry. You've recently received an email from me explaining our new personal care services plan. We want to continue to be the church by loving and caring for one another, even when we must maintain social distance from each other. If a need arises, please take advantage of the service. But also I want you to know if you come across family or friends who are not part of the church and have urgent needs arise in their lives, let us know for we must continue to be the love of Christ to those outside the church family whenever possible. And remember to contact John or Cheryl Knight. The beauty of being part of God's family in times of crisis is we know that God is always with us. His grace and love are always part of our lives. We know that we have each other to encourage and support and care and lift us up. And for these two reasons, we know we're never alone in crisis. We have the power of prayer, and we've seen some amazing answers to prayer in individuals' lives over these last four weeks. And so remember to continue to send in those prayer requests to Dana Aiken, who manages the, uh, the church prayer chain. And finally, church is never only about us, but how we care and share the love and truth of Christ with others in practical, practical, meaningful ways, even when we are sheltering at home. And why not use Facebook as a vehicle for this? I'm going to give you an assignment in regards to this at the end of the message today, so be looking for that. As I was reflecting on my life and the coronavirus, I thought about what have been the most significant changes I've been forced to experience in my normal life routine. Beyond washing my hands 25 times per day and staying away from people, I've tried to chronicle some of these changes for you. You'll see several photos on the screen behind me, and the first one represents that I haven't been able to get a haircut for seven to eight weeks now. And what you see this morning is the results of a lot of well-placed moose. I've also set up a bike trainer about three weeks ago in my family room in front of the TV, and I've ridden it every week. I just can't understand how I'm not getting into shape. I'm gaining pounds instead of losing them. I truly miss going to the fitness center. I've also barbecued several times over the last few weeks, and I feel like I'm really getting the master it. I'm still not sure why everything's coming out charred well. Every time I barbecue, my family has ordered takeout pizza from Pizza Hut or from the local Chinese restaurant. I, I just don't get it. I've also gotten the opportunity to watch a few movies, mostly chick flicks that my wife Lisa loves, and I, I hate, I can't stand them. Lisa has inquired as to why I'm watching them while she's at work. I guess I'm really one of those husbands trying to connect more deeply with his wife during this time of shelter at home. Hey, I'm a man's man. I only watch those movies to make my wife happy. Seriously though, 
I follow the CDC's guidelines for sheltering at home, washing my hands, sanitizing surfaces, social distancing, staying hydrated, taking my vitamins, and so should you. All humor aside, this really is serious stuff, and I want you to be safe. Since I spent a lot more time at home and fear that Lisa or Ben could bring the virus home with them from work, I've set up a sanitation zone outside that they have to go through before they can come in the house. I'm not taking any chances. It's like I have my own human car wash. And don't worry about that sign that Lisa's holding up there. Don't pay attention to my wife. Things are really good at home. As you can see, I have way too much time on my hands. I thought that maybe a little humor could lighten things up a bit. I guess the term that really best describes me over the last few weeks is stir crazy. I can be a loner with the best of them, but I miss seeing you guys on Sundays and midweek at growth group, and I really miss those hugs. I try to make sure to get daily updates about the coronavirus from my family and the church, and I have to admit there are days when I experience a general sense of uneasiness and uncertainty about what's happening in our world. I wouldn't call it a panic, but more like feeling like I'm on edge. Have you felt that way? I don't know if you've experienced this, but there are times when I cough or sneeze or experience chest congestion or tightness and I ask myself, are these symptoms of the virus? Did I catch it? Should I call my doctor? Should I get tested? Anyone doing that? These are unprecedented times and never have we experienced anything like it. It's serious and it can be unnerving. As of this morning, more than one million have contracted the coronavirus worldwide in over 200 countries with 53,000 fatalities, and the numbers keep rising daily. My heart aches and my prayers go out to every family who has lost a loved one who, or has someone lying sick in the hospital. In one week, there were 1.3 million unemployment claims filled in, filed in the U.S. six times that of any week in 2008 when the housing market crashed. 10 million unemployment claims in a month. Businesses everywhere have closed, and I I spoke to a couple of small business owners who don't know how they're going to survive, and many may not make it. People are uncertain of how they will pay their bills and afraid that they might lose everything. The stock market has taken a huge dive, negatively affecting many people's retirement funds and causing people to wonder if they'll have enough or will they even be able to retire. People who are in need of surgeries, People who live in daily pain have had to cancel scheduled surgeries not knowing when they might be able to reschedule and get the relief they desperately need. What are we to do when so much of this happening in our lives and our world is outside of our control? Where can we go to find a refuge from what feels like an endless storm? Is there really a place of strength and rest and hope in a world gone mad? The title of this morning's message is A Refuge in Times of Trouble. If you have a Bible close at hand, turn with me to Psalm 46, 1 through 3. And if you don't have a Bible close at hand, you're going to see the passage up on the screen behind me in just a little bit. But before we go to the text, let's go ahead and pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning for your greatness and for your majesty and your glory. We thank you for your love and your protection and your provision in our lives. And we want to lift up this morning those who have lost loved ones, and we pray that you comfort them in their grief. We want to pray for those who are sick, and that you put your healing touch upon them, and that they come to full recovery. We want to pray for the first responders, the doctors, and the nurses, heroes on the front line, that you would sustain them and strengthen them and protect them from getting sick. We want to pray for the president and his task force and all the government officials who are in charge of making decisions, and we pray that you give them wisdom and guidance and discernment. We pray for medications that will work, and, and Father, we pray for a vaccine that could be produced quickly. Father, we ask that you rid the world of this virus and return people to health, to their family, to their life, and to their jobs. And through it all, we pray that people would turn to you, that they would find you, find your love and grace and mercy and forgiveness, and place their faith in your son, Jesus. And we ask all this in his name. Amen. Well, if you're at Psalm 46, 1 through 3, let's go ahead and read there. It says, God is our refuge and strength, 
an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Well, David, the writer of many of the Psalms, is speaking of a time, possibly an experience, in the present or a time when he remembers in the past that his world was in chaos. The earth was giving way beneath his feet. The mountains were quaking, crumbling, and falling into the sea. The ocean waters were roaring and foaming and surging out of control. The language he is using seems to describe a deadly earthquake of which the region of Palestine was known for in that day. And if you've ever experienced an earthquake or a hurricane, a tsunami, a tornado, or a major flood, you know the feeling when things are happening in your world that you have absolutely no control over. I remember bringing a team to New Orleans for Hurricane Katrina relief. And another time when my boys and I brought a van of supplies that we picked up from three local churches to bring to Joplin to help with relief efforts there after a devastating tornado. I remember sandbagging several times with my boys during some of the major floods we've seen in Missouri. Life for people who suffer under natural disasters are never the same. They lose loved ones, houses, possessions, businesses, jobs. Many must start over with nothing. The language David uses to describe this natural disaster could easily be used to describe what many people are experiencing through the coronavirus. The question that needs to be asked and answered when bad things happen is, what is your refuge? Who or what is your go-to when you're experiencing difficult, painful, fearful times? Where do you go when you get bad news? When there's stuff happening in your life or world that leads to stress, anxiety, or fear? Where do you go for help or strength or comfort or relief? We all have something we use as our refuge in times of trouble. What is it for you and how reliable is it really? Pastor Robert Morris says, Christians, of course, would say, God is my refuge. But what if I gave you a truth serum? Would your answer be different? Would you maybe say that money is my refuge, or my job, or my retirement funds? Would you say my visa card is a very present help in times of trouble? Would you mention another person's name, or maybe a package of Oreos, a glass or two of wine, or veggie in front of the TV, or the computer game, or Facebook? Everyone needs a refuge, but that refuge should be reliable and trustworthy, someone that can give lasting comfort, strength, and relief in troubling times, someone who can calm fears and give lasting peace, who has the wisdom and power to change things. In Jesus' final teaching from the Sermon on the Mount, he explains what a person's life is like when they have a solid refuge, and contrast it to what life is like when they don't. Keep your finger in Psalm 46 and turn with me to the New Testament to Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to read there verses 24 through 27. And Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. And it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Let's we'll stop there. Jesus' metaphor speaks of a person's life compared to a house whose foundation is built on a rock. The rock spoken of here in the metaphor is Jesus himself and his word. 2 Samuel 22.3 says, My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation. He is my strength, my refuge, and my savior. The person who chooses Christ as his refuge, who trusts in his word as the foundation of his life, Stand strong without fear in the midst of a storm. But Jesus' teaching reveals there's another way to live. Other choices a person can make to try to find refuge in the midst of the storms of life. And let's continue on in Matthew 7, and let's read verses 26 and 27. Jesus continues and says, But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. If you're familiar at all with the rules of simple construction, 
You know that you should never try to build the foundation of a house on something like sand because it's not stable. It always shifts and moves. It's not solid. What would result is the foundation would move with it and start to crack until the entire house crumbled and crashed to the ground. The sand here represents the things we choose as our refuge other than Jesus when we're facing difficult, painful, anxiety-filled times. And the list can be many. It could be drugs, alcohol, porn. It could be food, money, your job, retirement. It could be things you try to control. It could be entertainment, exercise. It could be another person, your spouse, your child, or a friend. And not every refuge we choose other than God is a bad thing. And some do temporarily come through for us, but they cannot successfully replace God as our rock. Nothing or no one can be the kind of refuge that David declared God was for him, as he declared that God is my refuge, my strength, and ever-present help in trouble. There's no person, place, position, possession that can be that kind of refuge, that source of strength and be there as God desires to be in your life. Did you know that God wants to be all of those things for you? Well, let's go ahead and return to our main text. Let's go back to Psalm 46. And let's reread verses 1 and 2. And where David says, God is our refuge and strength, and ever-present help in trouble, therefore we will not fear. So often as Christians, we believe there's something we must do to secure these promises from God. But according to this passage, the only characteristic that must be part of our lives for God to be our refuge, our strength, and an ever-present help is trouble. We cannot know if God is an ever-present help in trouble unless trouble comes our way. God promises to be these things for us because they are part of who he is. There's nothing that God does in our lives that we deserve or have earned. He's this way, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. The only thing we really can do is trust and turn to him. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at these three aspects of who God promises to be in times of trouble. Let's take a look first at what the word refuge means. It means a place or person that provides safety. It means being sheltered and protected from pursuit, danger, or trouble. It means that to which one turns for help when in desperation. And God desires to be a refuge for you in times of trouble. How about that word strength? Strength means reliability in withstanding pressure, force, or stress. It's the power to act on behalf of another with great endurance. It's the condition of being free from defects or flaws. And God has an inexhaustible supply of strength that he wants to share with you. And finally, how about that word help? It means to carry another's burden in order to lighten the load. To offer all of one's resources and services to the one in need. To do everything in one's power to make things easier to handle. And God wants to help lighten your load in troubling times. And concerning being ever present, John 10, Jesus says, no one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. And in Hebrews 13, it says that he will never leave you or forsake you. And then in Romans 8, Paul says, nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when we face difficult times, we draw near to God. We worship. We're thankful. We're thankful for the blessings that are still in our lives. We pray. We go to his word and trust in his promises. We cast all our anxiety and the cares of the world on him because we believe in our hearts that he truly cares for us. We're in the midst of a global pandemic. A virus, a disease that has spread to over 1 million people throughout 208 countries and territories and has led to 50,000 deaths. The consequences have been extensive and far-reaching, radically changing life as we know it. It's placed the entire world in a panic. 
Will I contract the virus? Will I and my loved ones make it through this ordeal? And when we're faced with things outside of our control, we can begin to question life, question our own mortality. We begin to think about death and what's after this life. Is there a God and will I be okay with God when it's all been said and done? And when honest, we feel insecure about that. We fear the unknown and the uncertain. We've heard stories of heroic first responders, paramedics, firemen, policemen, heroic doctors and nurses and other medical professionals, all putting their lives on the line to help and treat the sick, to find medications and vaccines, something that will lead to the cure that will save people from death. And the beauty of their efforts is that only a small percentage of people who contract the virus will die, somewhere between 1% and 4% right now. What they're doing gives us hope for this brief life we have here on earth, that we will be victorious over this hidden enemy, and life as we knew it will return. But there's another pandemic that is rarely spoken of, and this one is a spiritual pandemic that has been around almost since the beginning of time. It infects every person who has ever lived. All 7.8 billion people who live right now are infected. A spiritual virus was contracted at birth. A fallen human nature has been passed on to each and every one of us. And that spiritual virus that we're infected with is called sin. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What is sin? A transgression of God's moral law. Sin is an offense to God's holy character. It's rebellion and rejection of God and his ways. And if you think about it, it's really not hard to see when we're honest with, our, with ourselves that we're infected with sin. We feel those tinges of guilt and shame when we lie or cheat or steal. When we gossip, slander, judge or criticize others. When we use profane speech or words to cut other people down. When we know that we've been selfish or self-centered. When we've rejected or betrayed a friend. When we cheated on our spouse or abandoned our family, when we've given ourselves over to fits of anger and rage, when we've intentionally hurt someone by our words or actions, and when we've used or abused others for our own gain or pleasure, it's called sin, and we're all infected with it. And when Paul says that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, it means that we miss the mark of God's glory. It's like receiving a failing grade when it comes to God's acceptance and approval of us. Because God's mark, his passing grade is perfection. God is holy and he's morally perfect and nothing or no one can enter heaven, his perfect kingdom who's stained by sin. Paul goes on in Romans chapter 6 verse 23 and he says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that word wages, we know that that is something that we've earned. And he says here that the consequence is what we've earned by our sin is death. And it's just not speaking of a physical death when our existence here on earth comes to an end, but it's also speaking of a spiritual death, an eternal separation from God. Human beings can find a cure for a virus, and by doing so, they can save many lives. They can prolong people's lives. But the reality for us all is that 100% of us will die. And while it's probably not from, going to be from the coronavirus, we know that all of our days are numbered. And not one of us knows which day will be our last. And we have no cure in ourselves to overcome the spiritual pandemic we're infected with. The prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 17.9, is quoted as saying, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? What Jeremiah is trying to tell us is that we're self-deceived as to our own true condition, the true condition of our hearts. And we try everything in our own power to cure the spiritual virus, only to fail. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, For it is by grace that you are saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. 
Human beings have no remedy. They have no cure for this spiritual pandemic. No amount of heroic effort or extraordinary works can save us from it. We are desperate for a spiritual first responder. Someone who's willing to put himself and his life on the line to save us from the spiritual pandemic. Someone who would stand in the gap for us. Someone who could do for us what we could never do for ourselves. Someone who could provide the cure to what ails us. Someone noble, someone heroic, someone who would even be willing to die in our place so that we wouldn't have to. And that someone is Jesus. Who was given that very name Jesus because it means he will save his people from their sins. For the first 23 years of my life, I lived in an estranged relationship with my father. And I was bitter and angry. At the age of 15, I rejected religion altogether. I believed God was harsh and waiting to punish me. I believed he was distant and aloof and couldn't care less about me. I had no clue on how to get close to him. So I rejected him as well. And I chose as my refuge sports and girls. And then later went on to alcohol and drugs. I found some success in academics and athletics, and I had plenty of friends, but nothing ever satisfied for very long. There was a void inside that nothing could fill, and I, I grew so empty inside, it became a gnawing and aching pain that never left me, and it literally felt as if I was walking through life with a deep knife wound in my arm that could never heal. And when I lost my two sources of refuge that held me up, when I lost a young woman I had been with for years and I believed that I would be married to, and lost my dream of playing professional soccer because of a major knee injury that I never fully recovered from. When these two sources of refuge failed me, the house of my life that was built on shifting sand came crashing down. It's only then did I realize that Jesus was the cure. He was the remedy to what ailed me. He was the strong, firm, and stable refuge I searched for all my life. Jesus alone could save me from this spiritual pandemic. I turned from my sinful, empty way of living, and I placed my faith in Jesus. And he took away that emptiness, and he healed my wounded heart, and he helped me to forgive my father and fill that void that I could never fill within myself. And there was a peace that filled my heart like I'd never experienced before. And he gave me new purpose, a reason for my existence, a reason to live that was higher than just self and what this world had to offer. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, Paul says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. This Friday, the world will still be suffering under coronavirus. But in five days, Christians throughout the world on Good Friday will be remembering what Jesus Christ did on the cross to save us from our spiritual pandemic. And two days later, Christians throughout the world will be celebrating Easter. Remembering that this Jesus who suffered, died, and was buried also rose from the dead, proving that he had victory over sin and death for every person who believes in him. He is the source of the cure that ails us. And it's because of this we can say, God is our refuge and strength, and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. I'm exhorting you this morning to place your faith in Jesus today, right now. Tell him, Jesus, I believe you are God, that you died on the cross for my sin. Forgive me, come into my life, be my Savior. The moment you place your faith in him, he frees you from your spiritual virus and gives you his spiritual help. He exchanges your sin for his righteousness. He gives you eternal life in him, making you right with God forever. Not because of anything you did, but because of the heroic act he did on the cross over 2,000 years ago. The heroic act that he did to save you. 
Well, to close this morning, remember, church, that I said I have an assignment for you. And here it is. Pandemic or no pandemic, even with social distancing and sheltering at home, we're still called to fulfill the Great Commission. We're still called to share the love and gospel message of Jesus Christ with others. And I'm asking every Christian who has seen this message to pass it on to every Facebook friend and family member this week, inviting them to watch it. What a great way, while being sheltered at home, that we can get the good news of Jesus Christ out to hundreds, maybe even thousands of people. Ask every Christian friend that you have on Facebook to do the same. And then pray that as the name of Jesus is lifted up, that he will draw men and women and children to faith in him. Will you do that? Stand right now where you are and respond, yes, I will. Let's go ahead and close in prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and we rejoice in you that you truly are our refuge and our strength. That you are our help in times of trouble. And we thank you that even though we are facing a pandemic, a virus that can affect our bodies, that you came to cure us of the spiritual pandemic that we all suffer through sin. And Jesus, we thank you that as we draw near to Good Friday and Easter, we, we thank you and praise you that you chose to condescend to be in human flesh. We thank you that you lived a perfect life and that you went to a cross and that you were you suffered and you died so that your shed blood might forgive us of our sin that you took our place that you took the punishment that we deserve and as god punished you for our sin and as you carried our sin and as you rose from the dead proving that you had victory over sin and death that now you offer as a free gift to all who believe eternal life in you. And we thank you that you are such a great God. We continue to lift up what's going on in our world, and we pray, God, that you would heal this world, this land, of this spiritual pandemic, and of this physical pandemic, the coronavirus. We pray that you would glorify yourself in it. We pray that you would draw people to yourself. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this week, I want to encourage you to seek God, to pray often, to be safe, and have a great week as we all prepare to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God bless.